pushing buttons and pulling triggers. This is Gun Funny. Welcome to Gun Funny episode 347. Today I'm going to chat with Bob Bozart from Gideon Optics, discuss a new overreach from the ATF on firearms exports, highlight a futuristic new training simulator, and talk about new challenges to ATFs engaged in the business rule. I am your host, Ava Flannell. Bob, how are you doing today? I am doing wonderful. It's fantastic to be here. You've been a, uh, I dare I say, hero of mine. Uh, for a very long time, you're one of the first uh, two two a advocates I started following back when I, I really got into guns. So Aww. it's amazing to be here. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Well, that means a lot. Thank you. So I was actually just telling you before the show started that a bill, an anti gun bill in Colorado, was passed last night at 1 a.m. It is a bill that essentially they hired Department of Revenue agents to essentially do what the ATF is doing, where they visit FFLs and make sure that they're complying. Because for whatever reason, they think that FFLs have something to do with criminals getting guns in their hands, which could not be farther from the truth. And in fact, their own publications from the ATF actually says otherwise. It's like 0.100% that actually does. So they're spending Colorado spending three million dollars of taxpayers uh, money to implement this. And I think it comes out to maybe six agents total that are going to take care of twenty five hundred FFLs in Colorado. It's actually pretty laughable at this point. But again, it's just another stupid bill where they're just infringing on our rights and going after the good guys. So I'm not really happy about that. But the good news is, is that legislation session in Colorado ends May 8th. And that is not the case for everywhere. I used to actually think I've learned a lot about politics, but I used to think that the legislation session was the same for every state, but it could be completely different. Some states, they have legislation session every other year. Some go all year round. Some are even a shorter session. So it all kind of varies. But uh, in Colorado, May 8th cannot come soon enough. And at this point, the clock is sort of working on our side, although it's too soon to completely say, but still that assault weapons ban bill has not passed. It still has to go through Senate committee, which I think is going to happen in the next few days. And then it would have to go to the Senate floor for two votes. And the second vote, the second hearing on that floor is always going to be a voice vote, which I learned the hard way because I was like, what? They just voted on that and used their voices. And it's so crazy how they come up with this. It's like, okay, all in favor, say I, all in favor, say no. And sometimes the no's are actually louder than the eyes, but it's up to the chair's discretion as to who he hears the loudest. And then he'll be like, all right, I, that's the, the bill passed. And then, yeah, it's kind of crazy. And then that third reading, it is actually uh, logged in where it shows everyone's vote. So fingers crossed, we are definitely getting down to the nitty gritty, but I do feel fairly positive. I don't want to jinx anything, but I feel kind of positive about that. And I'll leave it at that. All right. So before we start talking about Gideon Optics, I want to take a quick break. Talk about IWI. If you guys haven't checked out the Carmel yet, you definitely need to. It is hands down one of my favorite guns. It's a short stroke gas piston rifle with a locking rotating bolt system for maximum safety and reliability. It comes with an M lock for that you can install accessories at either the three, six or nine positions on. It has a cold hammer forged chrome lined 16 inch free floated barrel for accuracy and long life. And it has a full length top rail. Also, the side charging handle, super easy to reverse that. So if anybody wants it on the right or the left hand side, let's say you're a lefty, all of those controls are actually ambidextrous and it's super easy to change out that charging handle. You don't need a gunsmith to do that for you. If I could do it, you can do it. It also has a side folding stock with a variable length of pull and adjustable cheek riser. And then lastly, a two position gas regulator for normal or suppressed. It is such a great package. I definitely recommend just shooting it because I feel pretty confident that once you shoot it, you're going to be sold and you are going to want it. 
when you go to their website, IWI.us, don't forget to use the code GUNFUNNY15, all one word, and that is going to get you 15% off your entire purchase in the web store. Learn the things you never knew on Deconstructing the Industry. Bob, thank you so much for joining me, especially last minute. I'm just going to tell listeners, I do not really have my crap, like my crap together, my shit together. (laughs) Whatever. It's my (laughs) show. I can say what I want. I don't really have it together. And I realized last night I was like, "Uh, I need a guest for tomorrow. (laughs) And I've been interviewing a lot of personalities the last you know, few weeks and I wanted to have a company on. So I'm like, all right, what companies, you know, am I a big fan of that I haven't had on? And I thought of you and you were nice enough to come on and with like not even 24 hours notice. So I am like so thankful for you. But for anybody who doesn't know who you are or what you do, can you just kind of give us a little lowdown on on all that good stuff? Yeah, first I'll say don't feel bad. Um, you'd be surprised how many podcasts or live shows I get invited on to in less than 24 hours. Actually, this is kind of the perfect storm. Yesterday, I found out the day before yesterday that I had one at five o'clock local time yesterday. And then oh. on the five <laughs> o'clock, I got invited to a 10 o'clock last night. Oh, and wow. I don't remember what time I got your message, but uh, yeah, you're like tomorrow. Like, sure, tomorrow. Why not? <laughs> um, that's what we're doing this week. Um, So who am I? I am Bob from uh, Gideon Optics. I've been officially in the industry for about the last five years, Uh, but I started out, I've been building, you know, building, shooting, um, really engaged in uh, in firearms personally, as I want to say more than a hobby, really, Uh, you know, but when I'm not working or uh, taking care of my children, I was playing with guns Um, since 2012. I got into building guns back in 2016. And actually, it was before 2012 is uh, when I first met Jordan, who owns Gideon Optics, as well as our other companies that have been uh, active in the firearms industry for over 10 years. So Gideon Optics is new, about a year old officially. Uh, I've only been here four to five years, but guns has kind of always been my love. uh, And I feel super blessed that uh, I had a different career in, uh, in telecommunications for almost 20 years and they decided they didn't need me there anymore. And uh, just absolutely blessed, lucky, whatever you want to call it. Uh, someone was smiling on me to, uh, to have stayed in touch with and friends with Jordan. And he needed some help just at the time. Uh, my old, uh, my old gig decided they didn't need my help anymore. Uh, so I am an enthusiastic amateur hobbyist, uh, turn, I guess, semi-industry professional. I don't consider myself an expert on anything, but I am absolutely excited to be here. i excited to see things like that IWI Carmel, actually, she just showed. I'm a shooter first and an industry industry person second, if that makes sense. When I see something, my eyes, my brain still looks at it mm-hmm. like the guy over 10 years ago that was first fascinated by the way an AR-15 worked. and wanted to take it apart and put it back together and know absolutely everything about that platform. Uh, I get excited about everything that happens around here. Nice. I love it. And so tell me a little bit about Gideon Optics. Like, when did they start? Because they're a new company. And it was kind of like, I mean, I know when I first saw you guys, it was at TruerCon last year. And it's kind of seemed like you guys popped up out of nowhere. And now I see you pretty often. Well, the idea of Gideon Optics started probably, it's been almost three years ago now. Um, And what we looked at was we saw, obviously, there's a lot of, you know, right? I could probably name a half dozen off the top of my head. There's a, there's a lot of optics companies out there, right? There's affordable optics. And then there were what we saw were, I don't want to call them expensive, but like really high-end optics, mm-hmm. right? And we looked at the where that was and thought of it from the perspective of a shooter, from who we are. Um, you know, we spent most of our, our lives, right? As uh, what I want to say, regular people with moderate means, I said, well, what out of all of this, if I was looking at this, what's missing? What do I really want? So we started looking to see if we could bring reliable products at an affordable price and offer a lifetime warranty that didn't require you to jump through a whole lot of hoops, right? We, we look at everything and see, can we do what we would want as consumers? Can we do it better? And can we do it more affordable? 
than everyone else is out there, right? Can we give the customer, the shooting public, what we would want? And it turned out that there that there was a place there. Um, we uh, ran down the rabbit hole, you know, looking for suppliers, um, looking at costs of everything, and came to the conclusion that we thought we could do it. Um, found a, a manufacturer that we absolutely love, that we hang out with several times a year, because um, that's the other important thing, right? We want to be able to trust who we're working with the same way uh, we ask customers to put their trust in us. So, nice. yeah. And part of it also was, uh, we just, you were just talking about legislation a moment ago. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other facets, right, of the other companies in kind of our family, we feel like the firearms industry is constantly under threat. We know it is constantly under threat from legislators. Mm -hmm. right? There's always one more law or some anti-gun group is trying to sue you out of business. And the optics business look to be somewhat safer. Yeah. Right. At least right now, there's not any legislation trying to uh, ban you from putting an LPVO on top of your rifle. Yeah. Uh, that's so, that's and, funny. And that, that also. Go ahead, well, I was going to say it's funny that you mentioned that because I was literally thinking that as I was looking at the, the show notes, I was like, well, at least you guys don't have to be worried about being banned. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which and, is uh, like also funny, but it yeah. shouldn't be funny, you know? Yeah. As crazy as it sounds, it also. Uh, doesn't just keep the lights on, lets us keep fighting that mm -hmm. legislation. Yeah. It's constantly threatening the rest of the gun industry. Um, we're, we're still, our other companies are currently um, actively involved in other suits against us and one or two that, that we're kind of, uh, kind of on the other side of it. Um, but this enables that revenue to keep coming in. Mm -hmm. It's almost, so we saw it as everything I just said, right? Can we bring an affordable product off our lifetime warranty, something that we would want to buy? something that we would trust. And the second was not let the anti-gun politicians and groups out there win, um, make it more difficult for them to, to sue us out of business. Right. We know a lot. That's what a lot of those uh, groups are after. They don't necessarily think they can legislate us away. Um, but if they can sue you and they can deplete, you know, deplete you down to where you're just going out of business, then they win. Yeah. Um, yeah. So a big part of it is not wanting them to win, to be able to stay in this fight. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about some of the other businesses that you guys own, because there's lots of other stuff that, you know, Gideon Optics is, uh, well, is it, is it, it's, is it one company where it's the umbrella and then all these other companies are underneath it? Um, no, it's all separate companies. Okay. Um, under and, Mr. Jordan. Okay. And do you mind if we talk about some of those other companies? Cause you guys are, I mean, you guys yeah, got can. a lot going yeah, it's on. It's my fault. I brought them up. I should have stayed focused. Right? No, I <laughs> no, I <laughs> think it's, on Gideon Optics. I think it's important though, because like JSD supply, right? That is, yeah. you guys are fighting a, a really important fight with, with that company, right? As far as like the 80% frames and stuff go. Yeah, and we're fighting a lot of like state and local ones as well. So everybody knows about the uh, about the big one, right? The Vanderstock that we're involved in. Uh huh. But there's a lot of there's a lot of smaller ones all over the place, and those ones are more taxing. We're not going to go too far down that rabbit hole of uh, with the lawsuits. But yeah, JSD Supply usually comes up in the origin story because that's the company that's been around the longest, right? Officially since 2013, but uh, Jordan actually started that several years before that, uh, just himself just mm -hmm. doing gun shows every weekend. Speaking of working on the weekends, he worked every weekend for years uh, mm -hmm. to build up the, you know, to build up enough capital to invest in some inventory um, and to get himself a, a little, a little building to start operating out of. Nice. So before we get ahead of ourselves, so what are the companies that Jordan also owns? Um, so we're Gideon Optics PR Triggers. Okay. This is the other, right? Is a, is a pull and release trigger. We have just uh, one product under that brand right now, but a handful of others planned for later this year. Uh, Patmos Arms is kind of the, I guess we can call it the, the manufacturing aspect, right? So that's the brand of the slides that we have made, um, lower parts kits, all that stuff. Uh, JSD Supply. And then on the gun show side is Eagle Shows which is about two thirds of the state of Pennsylvania was actually the, the first gun show that he got involved in. And more recently Mac shows, which is in the Midwest, um, like Iowa, Oklahoma. Um, what's that other state, Kansas and the big Reno show in Nevada. Now nice. we, uh, we are also owners of. Very cool. Yeah. I have oh to say, God. like, I do admire, I, I admire Jordan. I don't think I've ever met him. 
But I do admire, like, especially with me, you know, going to the Capitol and fighting this and realizing how few people in this industry actually fight. Like, it blows my mind that there's all these gun stores in Colorado and there's only a handful of people, like literally five that I could think of that are actually fighting this fight. And I don't think that it's just Colorado. I think that's, you know, across the U.S. And, you know, so there's lots of companies in this industry, like there's thousands, if not Yeah, I mean, I'd say there's thousands and very few are actually fighting the fight. And I think that more importantly, you know, to give your business to these companies that are fighting the good fight, you know, I mean, why should all these other companies get your money when they don't care if they're going to go out of business? Like they're not, you know, like I've, I've said before, there's there's stores and companies and then there's patriots and very few people are patriots. And that's what I admire about you guys is, you know, you're right there you know, in the front fighting it all. And that's why I'm like, I'm really proud to get behind your guys' brand. Thank you. Yeah. We don't really talk about it enough. And every now and then I say, you know, we really should, or I'll see another company uh, publish something right where they donated X number of dollars to a, you know, to a a gun rights organization. We really don't talk about it. Right. We don't uh, talk a lot about the lawsuits we're involved in. We don't talk about who we're donating money to or where we're involved in what fight. Mm-hmm. Um, again, and maybe that's because, uh, Jordan and, and the entire company, we kind of look at all this as the perspective that we're the shooter. Mm-hmm. Um, we look at that. We look at those donations and all those things we're involved in and that money going out as something we're fighting for our own rights. Yeah. Um, you know, most of us have, have children and families. We, we look as we're fighting for the rights of our family, of our community. Um, yeah. it's not, it's not something we do for marketing. So why we talk about it in that fashion, you know, it's just. It's just part of what we got to do. Um, and we think we think that's what people expect of us. And that's back to what I said about uh, wanting to give customers what we would want ourselves. Yeah. Um, I would want to know or believe, right? I would want to trust that the company I was buying from uh, was was on the same side with me, right? Mm-hmm. Was fighting for my rights. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to take a quick break. Talk about Gators. Definitely do your eyes a favor and upgrade your sunglasses or range glasses. All Gators lenses are safety rated, so they're good for shooting, but they also look great off the range too, which is literally my go-to. Like I used to be the type that would wear all of these expensive brands. Like I had my little Gucci glasses and you know, whatever, whatever. And I got to say, I've retired those because now I'm all about Gators and I'm not kidding. I know people are probably like, oh, please, you're just saying that for this ad. Like catch me anywhere, anytime. If I'm wearing sunglasses, it is Gators. But additionally, they also have the mil spec ballistic lenses that are rated to take a hit from a 15 caliber projectile at 700 feet per second without cracking. So like they are the real deal. They're not just, you know, something that you're going to buy that's, you know, it's they're not inexpensive, but know that it's good quality stuff and your eyes are definitely going to be protected, especially if you're, you know, depending on where you're at. And let's say you go to a range day or something and there, there might be the chance of more ricochets or something like that. Like you want to make sure that your eyesight is protected. I couldn't even imagine what would happen if I lost my eyesight. Definitely check them out. They have a bunch of lenses out there that I guarantee will make any face look great, male or female. Use the URL gators.com forward slash Ava15. And with that URL, you're going to get 15% off your entire order. Let's talk about what Gideon Optics offers. So for a while, you guys were just all about the red dots. And you had some for long guns and then handguns, um, which I've really grown a fan of. And then as of recently, you guys added a prism and then an LPVO. So you guys are like kind of stretching your legs a little bit and kind of, you know, like I'm I'm really like interested to see what else you guys come out with because so far I'm like, just when I'm like, okay, I really like all these red dots, then that prism, I'm not, I will say I'm not really a, a prism fan. And now I'm like, I don't know which one I like better if I like the red dot or the prism. <laughs> Because it's like, it's kind of a toss up. I've had, you know, I have multiple of uh, like the mediator, really like that red dot. And then that prism, really like that. And I have multiple of those so that I can put them on different guns. And then the LPVO, I will say, I haven't put that on a rifle yet. I'm trying to figure out which one, but 
everything that you guys have come out with has just been really good quality. But then best of all, it's affordable because I used to be that type of person where I would, you know, I'd put together a gun or I'd buy a gun and it wasn't inexpensive. And then you're like, oh man, I can't even shoot it because I don't have an optic on it. And then it was like, oh, it was kind of like an afterthought. And then it was like, it kind of hurt just pain, you know, shelling out like 500 plus dollars for an optic. And that's what I like about your stuff is, you know, a lot of your stuff's just, it's really affordable, but it's good quality. Yeah. Well, we, uh, we decided we kind of roadmapped uh, the rest of the product line, right? You're absolutely right. So it was uh, a year ago on April 15th that uh, at NRAM last year is when we offered our first products for sale. And it was just three different RMR footprint optics, the Alpha, the Rock, and the Omega, and the Judge, which is the the micro, the smaller, the RMSC optic. Um, And we already had ideas about the next ones, but wanted to make sure that we knew what we were doing, right? That we had a product, had those first products really, really locked down, right? That we didn't have any question that we were going to be able to stand behind them with that lifetime warranty. They were going to perform and be reliable for everyone out in the field, but kind of already had this whole roadmap um, sort of planned out, right? Not specifically the reticles, not necessarily the, uh, the aesthetics or the housings, but well, we know we want at least two LPVOs, right? We want at least a second focal plane, a first focal plane. And you have that already. The one through 10 guardian is the second focal plane is the first one that came out with the one through eight, uh, first focal plane LPVO um, has a very different reticle, right? We didn't want to just slap the same one in a first focal plane because there's out folks out there that don't know. Second focal plane means that when you increase the magnification, the reticle stays the same size. In yeah. A first focal plane scope, when you increase the magnification, that reticle increases in size with the object, right? So it requires two very different uh, reticle designs, but the one in eight will be out the end of this month. And to the prism points you were just talking about, I was the same way. I had tried a prism in the past um, and I have apparently a little bit of an astigmatism, but not a ton of it. So I didn't really quote unquote, see the need for it. Right. It was like, Oh, this is kind of cool, but you know, it has an eye relief. It's not the same. It's not as easy. It didn't feel as easy as point and click as a red dot is. Uh, but now that I'm involved in a company where I have access to just grab a prism, you know, grab a couple of them and put them on a couple of different guns and really get to play with them without having to shell out all that money, right? Without often having to buy a bunch of models in order to be able to test them out and see what works best for my eyes or what I like the best. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely sold. Uh, yeah. All my red dots are probably going to turn into prisms. I know, so, right? I was while, thinking while the there same is, thing. Uh, it, it's the, the eye relief of the eye box part. Right. Yeah. So we know that scopes have an eye relief. There's an optimal distance that your eye should be from that exit pupil for you to have the largest perfect sight picture. And with a prism, the first time I touched one, right, I was doing kind of the same thing I do with a scope, trying to find that exact right distance from my eye. And here's where I have to mount it on the rail. And I have to have the exact same cheek weld every time to get that clear picture. Mm -hmm. And it's really not as necessary as I originally thought, or as though, uh, or as a lot of people might think, mm-hmm. um, while it is best, right. You get the largest circle. If you're shooting with two eyes open, you can really just go ahead and put that prism as far down the rail as you'd like. And you're still getting that reticle, right? It may be a little bit larger black circle of the body around it. If you're far away from your eye. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, Mike, our, uh, Mr. Mr. Mike Branson that's with us as well. Um, he kind of taught me that, or I guess I saw him put a video on our YouTube where he was shooting a, uh, a 12 gauge shotgun and he had it all the way down the the top rail. And I was like, Mike, I, we, you know, it's, it's advertised. We say you got to have, you know, it's three and a half inches away from your eyes, the eye box. What are you doing? How are you using that? He's like, well, have you ever tried it? Just try it. It's like, you're still going to get the same reticle. You're still going to get the same clear sight picture that what we perceive as a kind of a black ring around the class, Mm -hmm. it's just going to seem a little bit larger when you're further away. And he was absolutely right. Hmm. Um, Yeah. I don't think I could ever go back. Yeah. I'm I'm putting prisms on everything. I know. Right. (laughs) I'm going to be like Oprah. I'll be like, you get a prism, you get a prism. No, (laughs) we are almost out of them too. So uh, they, they've really taken off. Uh, I did not expect that. Right. We saw it as something that is kind of new to the industry. Um, prisms are, have only really been around the semi-affordable prisms for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, we weren't quite sure 
um, how well those were going to go. Um, but we're down to, we're down to just a couple boxes left. Wow. Uh, now we should have those restocked in early June, but we're down from, you know, a pallet's worth mm -hmm. um, just a couple months ago when we launched them. Uh, and now we're, we're almost out. Wow. That's one thing I have noticed. There's a lot of people that have uh, written in, you know, with Pew Pew panel because you guys sponsor that show and they're like, yeah, I want to get one, but it's not in stock. And it wasn't the prism, but it's like a few other. So I've, I said this, I think on the last show, I was like, you know, I think that there people are realizing like how great these optics are, especially at the price and they're selling out rapidly. Like you guys, I think your biggest hurdle, I guess, is like keeping these things in stock. Yeah. And believe it or not, right. It sounds, uh, I should have said this, the part where we decided to, I guess I opened the door, right. To talk about all the other companies we own. Um, you would think, oh man, those guys got an empire. They just got money to throw at the wall. We really don't. Mm -hmm. Um, when you think about the activism and the lawsuits and all of the mm -hmm. Jordan and myself, we consider it top priority to keep all of our people employed, right. The most important thing we can do is, uh, is create and keep jobs, right. Let everybody, uh, keep roofs over their heads and, and keep their families taken care of. So yeah, that's, that's what it comes down. We're not out of stock, um, just because we're dumb or because we hate you. Um, it's that, you know, we, we have budgeted, right. This is how many of this we can buy. And yeah. once these sell, we can buy more of these. Um, and we're getting to a better place, right. We're, we're building up where as we sell more then we have more to invest in inventory. Mm -hmm. And honestly, with just a year's worth of data, um, well, you probably know you've been involved in various businesses. Um, it's, it's, or you've been in the industry a long time. Um, till you have some data, it's tough to forecast what your needs are going to be. Yeah. We absolutely. can't, it, you know, we can't spend all of our money just buying, you know, thousands of prisms because then we end up out of something else, right? We went three months where we were out of the, uh, the RMSC, the mm -hmm. judge, the yeah. micro dot for pistols. Um, yeah, from like October, November, all the way until uh, I want to say it was February, maybe March till we finally got those back. Yeah. Um, that's because we had to invest in more Omegas because the Omegas all ran out. Um, the, the largest window RMR that we have right now, anyway, we've got a larger window one coming this summer. That's actually, I mean, that's really well said though, because like, for example, let's say 2020, you know, okay. So federal, federal ammo. They're one of my sponsors. I love them. They're amazing. They've been so great to me. And they've been so supportive, too, with my political journey, too, because I'm like, I know a lot of things have kind of been put on the back burner. And they're like, no, like, you're we appreciate the fight. But they, you know, as you know, in 2020, everybody needed ammo. And it was like, you know, hard to find and stuff. And they learned because the gun industry, a lot of times will have these peaks and valleys. And lots of people are like, well, I don't understand. Why aren't these ammo companies, you know, just buying more machines to make more ammo? But these machines are like millions of dollars. Or, you know, they'd end up employing a lot of people to help make a lot of the ammo. And then as soon as there is that valley, then they have to lay people off or they end up in debt because sales start to decline and then they're eventually giving these products away. And so federal told me, I think it was in 2020, 2021, they were like, no, we learned our lesson. Like the last thing that they wanted to do was lay anybody off. And so as a result, they weren't ramping up production. I mean, they had the machines going 24 seven, but like they weren't going out to, you know, trying to hire more people, you know, because that was like the last thing that they wanted to do. So it's actually a very smart though. Like I think any successful business owner will tell you that, you know, you can't just go big overnight and you have to still stay within your means in order to have a successful business. So I appreciate yeah. that. Bob, I'm going to take another quick break. Talk about Mantis. If you guys want to take your dry fire to a whole new level, you definitely need to check out the Mantis X10. They also have the X2 and the X3, which are very similar, but that X10 is Mantis's latest generation of shooting performance systems. It's smaller and lighter, and it has a longer battery life. They mount directly to a Picatinny rail, but if you don't have one, they have adapters that you can put on either your magazines, your shotgun tubes, and much more. The X10 gives you an incredible amount of data on your shooting performance, both from dry fire and live fire. I will say, so I've only been using the X10 now for... I want to say maybe two years, a year and a half. And when I first started, I would get anywhere from like, I would score anywhere from like seventies to eighties. 
And lately it's like, I mean, just doing it just a few times. I don't really do it religiously by any means, but I've noticed even just the dry fire is greatly improved. So if you guys are looking to take your shooting to the next level and you want to see exactly like, you know, what you might be doing wrong, uh, that movement before, during and after you squeeze that trigger, all that good stuff, or you know, maybe you want to use that X10 in conjunction with the Laser Academy, which is something that I like to do. Lots of different options, but I'm I'm telling you, it has been so effective and it has helped my shooting so much. And then also on top of that, so you could also live fire with that X10, which you can't with the X2 and the X3. And then you could also do like, let's say, uh, drawing from your holster. It offers draw holster analysis. And then you could also use it on your archery as well. So lots of different options. You're not just uh, stuck with like using it on your handgun. You could use it on on many different other platforms. But check it out, mantisx.com. You mentioned that you guys were using the optic on a shotgun. So I'm kind of curious, like, what kind of recoil testing do you guys do to ensure that the optics can handle bigger calibers? Uh, that, is, that mostly ends up being uh, Jordan and I. Jordan is, uh, owns the guns that are in the, the larger, like, hunting calibers, right? Everything up to, like, 7.62, 12 gauge, and 5.56. Five, mm-hmm. I kind of take everything person. Now, obviously, at the factory, right, they're tested and they're rated to however many thousand Gs. And not that we don't trust that, but again, I want, I want customers to be able to trust me to trust us the way that I would want to. Yeah. Uh, UI. So I personally grab at least 300 rounds of, you know, every caliber, not, not all in the same day. Usually I usually do a handful where I do a nine millimeter 45 ACP. I'll do all my pistol calibers in one day. Then I'll grab a handful of rifles and take them out, right? Load up a bunch of magazines. So I'm ready. Um, and I'll take the same optic and transfer it to all of these. I don't know if that's, uh, I don't know if that's how other companies do it or not. Right. So I might have 2000 rounds that I've put on this one optic of assorted calibers rather than mounting an Omega on a pistol and then mounting a different one on a rifle. I literally took that same optic and put it on all the pistols I wanted to test on and then put it on an AR and then put it on an AR nine and then put it on uh, an AK and then stuck it on the shotgun. Um, and I hope, I think, at least in my head, uh, that's a, a, what do I want to call it? A better test, I guess. Mm-hmm. Like I could just fire a thousand nine millimeter rounds, um, but I don't, and then use a different optic for different guns. I think that's the way a lot of other companies do it. And not not disparaging any company that does it that way. Um, I would just rather beat on that same one because those re- recoil impulse, those different firearms aren't just stronger or lighter right? A lot of them are moving differently. So we may feel the recoil the same way, but the actions aren't the same. Some of them may be pushing more up. Some of them may be pushing more down. Uh, They hit a little bit different. So I'd like to have the same optic and know that if a customer did that, right? Because I've been that guy, right? I have a, I have a, a cheaper brand red dot laying around here somewhere that was on probably six different guns over a period of five years. Cause I couldn't afford it anymore. Right. I'd build, I could afford the new gun, but I couldn't afford more glass because everything was either too expensive or, or too cheap and I didn't trust it. So I would move the same optic across several firearms. Hmm. Um, so yeah, that's mostly me. And then I also do the drop testing. That's uh, actually one of the things I've grown to enjoy the most. Uh, I haven't personally done drop testing on the LPVO yet. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a guy, uh, got a channel called Delta D80, who's become a friend of ours. He usually gets to drop the newer stuff before I get to drop them. Um, But I hopefully eventually will. But yeah, uh, three feet and six feet um, onto solid rock or solid concrete. Hmm. It's kind of the end of the test. It's not the beginning of the test. Um, If you look at the Gideon Optics YouTube, you'll see a little bit of me breaking stuff. Hmm. Um, But yeah, I I consider that, I don't want to say more important. I feel like the industry, right, or the optics industry has grown to a point where if you know and you see how it's being manufactured, you can trust that G's rating, right? As far as recoil absorption. Yeah. Um, I, I'm more concerned about that destructive testing. I think that's the the more important one. That's the one that doesn't always get done in a factory. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the one that you can't really tell by putting on a machine that shakes an optic back and forth. You can't tell what's going to happen uh, when you smash it into a door because, uh, you know, you're using it in some type of law enforcement capacity. Yeah. Um, yeah, or drop it on a rock or drop it down a ravine while you're hunting. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Moving back to the LPVO. So are you guys planning on expanding that line? 
Yeah. So I think I already mentioned the one through eight first focal plane mm-hmm. um, is coming out here in the next two months. I'd like to say four weeks, but I'd rather double it and uh, and then for sure be right uh, under promise and over deliver. Oh, so it hasn't come out yet? No, no. Oh. One through eight. You, uh, you might have seen on our Instagram, Michael is already testing the, the one to eight. Um, we've also got a one to six planned. And for longer ranges, uh, the first of our kind of uh, longer range scopes will be a five through 25. Uh, and that's also in Mike's hands right now because um, he kind of uh, designs the reticles for us. Mm-hmm. So we get the first one with our reticle in it. So the way it works is we get a production sample made, right? So do we like the size? Do we like, is the clarity of the glass acceptable? All of that kind of stuff. And then Mike designs the reticle. So then we get more samples that have our reticle in it with the illumination. And then Mike goes out and kind of field tests that as well, because he's been in the optics game a lot longer, right? I am for sure an amateur when it comes to longer range scopes. Yeah. So five through 25 should also be out by the end of summer. I'm going to call that July of 2024, Um, but there's a lot of people pretty excited about that. Uh, Nice. Very cool. And then lastly, let's talk about your lifetime warranty, because I know not to talk about competitors optic, but I know one competitor that it's funny because like, I don't even hear about them at all anymore. But one company specifically, they were known for like their lifetime warranty. And that's what kind of like, I think, made them so popular. And then as I started looking into other optic companies, I'm like, you know, there's quite a few optic companies that have that same lifetime warranty. I guess they just don't constantly push it like that's not what they lean on in order to sell their products but let's talk about you know what that lifetime warranty covers anything except intentional damage right so that includes accidental um we have already exchanged a handful of optics um, for no cost to the customer right so if it's a, a warranty concern we pay shipping both ways that includes you dropped it, you bang it off of, right? Those things that I was just talking about that I enjoy testing mm-hmm. um, in case something like that happens to someone else. It doesn't matter why it happened. Um, if we can still tell that it was a Gideon optic, and we've also got uh, serial numbers in places that would be more difficult to damage. So we can kind of verify that if we really need to. But um, if we can tell it used to be ours, um, it's warrantied. And it came up on a show I was on last week, actually. So let's go ahead and talk about transferability. Um, I guess I've only thought about that in uh, in regards to car warranties, um, but I did have a, a host of a show um, pop in and say, well, what if, uh, you know, I die and it's my son and it gets defective? Like, well, then him as well. You know, we don't require proof of purchase. So I guess it is transferable if you get it secondhand and it's, uh, and it's not working or it's been accidentally damaged. Uh, yeah, we pay the shipping both ways and, uh, and get you another one. Hmm. Very cool. And again, that's that's because that's the way we would want to be treated. Um, we've uh, most of us have dealt with warranties, lifetime or otherwise, in the past, and it can be it can be pretty exhausting. And we also get it, right? There are uh, warranties, uh, or rather, the less money you spend on warranties, I guess the uh, the more money you can spend other places. Uh, mm-hmm. But we don't see it that way. We want you to be able to trust your optic, and if it quits working or if you break it. Uh, we don't want you to be out, you know, another couple hundred dollars mm-hmm. to replace it. Uh, yeah. Nice. Okay, cool. Bob, thank you so much for sharing all of this information about Gideon Optics and everything that you guys do as uh, a company, you know, in general. Can you guys just tell listeners what the website is and where they can follow you on social media? And then also, I guess, check out your YouTube channels, which I didn't even know that you guys were putting out all these, you know, great videos, but I definitely want to check them out as well. Yeah, we're working on building it. What the, What is really there if you want to be entertained? Or want to believe in getting optics products our youtube channel you can watch uh, my destruction videos but mike does a fantastic job of doing like actual tips uh, he has videos on there mounting several different of our optics he also has a video specifically on the slimline box like the g4348 moss models and how to mount an optic correctly on there because it can be tricky uh, on the right hand side in particular where the extractor is hmm. uh, on Twitter and Instagram, we are Gideon Optics, all one word. It can be tough to search us on there for whatever reason. I think it's because our accounts are newer. The same thing with the YouTube. It is Gideon Optics, all one word. But 
I guess it's a great thing that when you first search Gideon Optics, all one word on YouTube, you're going to see all of the folks that have put content out uh, with our with our optics over the last year. Uh, some really great channels that we're really excited and pleased to be working with like yours. Nice. Very cool. And guys, Gideon Optics. So Gideon is spelled G-I-D-E-O-N. And Bob, you were nice enough to give the listeners a code where they can get 10% off. And that code is gun funny, all one word. Does it matter if it's capitalized or lowercase? It is not case sensitive. I'm sorry. Okay. I was supposed to say that. Gideonoptics.com. Use coupon code gun funny for 10% off and free <laughs> shipping every day. And that includes sale items, whether it's on sale or not, you're getting 10% for being here and listening to Ms. Ava. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Politics. What is going on in the world today? It's political AF. Interium Pause is here to stay. I talked almost six months ago about the 90-day pause the Commerce Department issued on firearms exports and how it hurt the firearm industry and wasn't really going to be a pause. On Wednesday, after a pause of more than 180 days, the Commerce Department announced an interim final rule amending the Export Administration regulations to, quote, enhance the control structure for the firearms and related items. Once again, this is gun control without any legislation passing. Unfortunately, with export licensing, the executive branch already has a lot of authority, but as you'd expect, they're highly deceptive in how they are justifying the new rule. The new rule targets semi-automatic firearms with new export control classification numbers, adds additional license requirements for crime control and detection items resulting in additional restrictions on availability of exceptions for most destinations and more red tape. Basically, as I said three months ago, the quote unquote pause to review export policies was farce. Now they've made permanent policies to ban exportation to a bunch of places to hurt the industry and make them less profitable. There will be three new export control classification numbers for semi-auto rifles, pistols, and shotguns. Export licenses will only be for the single year now instead of four years. All existing licenses will be revoked 60 days after the interim rule takes effect on May 30th, and companies will have to reapply. They justify denying exportation to these countries by saying that they are quote-unquote at risk, yet less than 1% of firearms legally exported are traced to a crime. Currently, this includes 36 countries, including ones in Latin America, the Caribbean, and Southeast Asia. Licenses will only be approved on a case-by-case basis, considering foreign policy, national security risks, government corruption, diversion of firearms and human rights abuses, and other criteria. In all of these countries, there are lots of shooting enthusiasts like us who will be unable to buy our guns, and the industry is expected to lose far more than $250 million in sales. The public comment period on this rule will stay open until July 1st, and NSSF is considering legal options to fight this latest overreach by the Biden administration. And I don't know how many times I have to say this, but it's like if they can't make a rule or a law that's banning guns. They're like, okay, let's get creative. How else can we hurt, you know, the industry? And this is by far one of them. I mean, 250 million in sales is a lot of money to lose. Doing the same thing they're trying to do to us. They're just going to do it for the entire world now. Mm-hmm. Um, or tie the entire country. Yeah. That's absolutely insane. Yeah, absolutely. I know. So I would definitely recommend if you guys are just as upset about this as I am, definitely go over and add a public comment you know, I want to say that like, oh, they'll read everything. They may not. But I do think that, again, being loud and noisy is going to help. It's definitely helped in the fight in Colorado just because they see, OK, people are actually watching what we're doing and they might be a little reluctant to pass this. But we'll see. But I would definitely, you know, again, do not be complacent. That is the worst thing that you can do. This segment is brought to you from Rose by Sig Sauer. I'm here with Jesse Perry. She attended the Boca Raton, Florida retreat, which I'm super jealous of. 
Jesse, it's so great to have you on. I feel like I know you just because you're part of the Rose Community Facebook group and you're very active in that group. And we've talked on there. We haven't officially met, but I do feel like I I know you. (laughs) (laughs) So I have to ask. So, okay, for one, like, why did you choose to go on the Rose Retreat? Um, honestly, it's just something that I wanted to do, like being involved in that and just the ladies, the community. I mean, come on, it's Lena Michalik, you know, <laughs> you get to learn from her. And, and I felt like I knew all these ladies to begin with before I ever actually met them. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it was just I had to go. It was a, it's once in a lifetime kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So I have to know. So they said that this trip was going to be bougie, which I'm like, OK, I went on the Nashville retreat. I thought that was super bougie. In fact, I think I've mentioned this in previous episodes. They rented out the entire like white limousine place, which is Dolly Parton's. And oh. funny enough, uh, the woman who played Dolly Parton, which did an, an amazing job, actually saw her on a reel the other day playing Dolly Parton. And I sent it to a few of the ladies that went on that retreat. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure this is her. And they're like, oh, my gosh, it is. But oh. uh, so I have to know, like, what were the details? Like, what all did you guys do? Because obviously in every retreat, you guys get, you know, some range time with Lena. They go over like how to clean your gun and stuff like that. But like there's also things that they focus on that are important in that city. And there's different things. So that's why it's like you could go on all of the trips and experience something new every time. Oh, absolutely. Um, Well, it was in Boca Raton, which uh, the city driving through the city itself from the airport to the resort was bougie enough on its own. <laughs> and then and then we get to the resort and the resort is very exclusive, like there was a man at the gate and, and I'm in, in one of those in, in a gate guard thing. But the, the guard house itself was probably as big as my living room in my own house. Mm-hmm. Like nice. you, you had to get buzzed in. Wow. And like breakfast every morning was in this great big hall that reminded me like of a church cathedral type. Oh, it was just it was oh, gorgeous. I think I saw oh. a picture of that and I was like, that looked really beautiful. And you oh, it was I have to say what I loved about like you going on this trip is you kept us all updated with all the pictures. So ladies, if you're listening, yeah. So ladies, if you're listening and you haven't joined the Rose Community Facebook group, definitely do so. Just do like a search for Jesse Perry and you'll see exactly what she was talking (laughs) about. Because I saw that room and I was like, dang, that's really pretty. I didn't know that that's where you guys were having breakfast every morning. That's where we had breakfast. Um, We had catered lunches every day. The evening dinners, oh my goodness, talk about mind-blowing just food. Like, I'm a huge foodie, Mm -hmm. so that was a big deal for me. Like, at every attention, every detail, like every detail part of that food, like from waiters walking around in suits and ties holding hors d'oeuvre trays to waiters that had a bottle of red and a bottle of white wine in their hands walking around making sure we're okay. There were waitresses walking around with pitchers of water to make sure that we were okay. Like, I know in the Rose community, there have been people that have kind of, you know, it's it's expensive. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of money to go on these Rose retreats. It's not about the range time necessarily yeah. with Lena. It's about all the other stuff. Like, all the details that they do, connecting with all the ladies, just building that bond with everybody that's there yeah absolutely was there anything like did you guys go to any restaurants or was it pretty much just all taking place at this like facility it was all taking place at this resort they had oh my goodness how many i don't even know how many restaurants they had right there on the property wow they had bars they had a spa they had like six different pools they had a lazy river they had water slides they had one of those flow rider like surfing type machines in one of the pools i mean anything and everything you could want it was right there we did not have to leave for anything other than the range day wow that's amazing it was great i have to ask were you a little nervous going and you know meeting all these women because there was probably about what was it like maybe 25 to 30 women that went Yep, there were 30 women, plus Lena, plus the Rose admin team, plus the SIG guys, the, mm-hmm. the training team. I wasn't nervous at all. I was excited. I probably, I can't even tell you how many times I cried while I was there. I was just so excited. Yeah, that's awesome. It, 
it was fantastic. All right, cool. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for sharing the trip with us. I'm going to ask you a bunch of other questions in the next few episodes. So guys, definitely tune in for that. But in the meantime, if you want to check out when the next retreat is, or any of the other Rose stuff or the gun, which is ultimately, I guess how this, you know, came about, but it's so much more than just the Rose P365 firearm, head on over to sixhour.com forward slash Rose, and then also find us in the Rose Community Facebook group. Just search for Rose Community. Let them know that I sent you. And it's just a great community of women. Tactic Talk. Discussing popular guns and gear. Love it? Hate it? Find out now. Today in Tacti Talk, Dry Fire goes virtual. The world of Dry Fire has come a long way in recent years. Mantis, for example, has revolutionized the industry with the Mantis X and Blackbeard, but there's other companies working on cool things too. But now there's a new system that incorporates Dry Fire with virtual reality. A new company called Ace XR has created a new virtual training system that works with the MetaQuest virtual reality headset, which I have to admit, I don't even know what that is. I haven't, I haven't done much virtual reality stuff, but I, I mean, now I feel like I have to. But anyways, the virtual reality headset gives you a number of drills to run and practice fundamentals. There are competitions that you can do in even some virtual scenarios. The Ace Arctis headset is shaped like a firearm and has a part of the top of the plastic slide that looks kind of like a red dot from the side, but it's really a part to hold the control from the MetaQuest on top. Controls in the Arctis grip then engage the buttons of the Quest controller. Reportedly, the trigger on the grip isn't that great, but some people are already 3D printing better triggers and other parts to improve the experience with. That says to me that probably more development is needed, but it's exciting to see how the technology like this uh, comes about. A couple drawbacks I see is it's pretty expensive and you're not training with a real firearm like you do with like, say, Mantis. So it costs about $20 a month plus the Ace Arctis headset, which is about $199, plus a MetaQuest VR headset, which is $500 or more. dollars. That said, it's a cool technology, and I think we'll see something like it perfected in the future. I'd love to see a virtual reality component incorporated with a module like the Mantis X so that you can actually use your real firearm and you have those actual real controls and stuff that you can train with. I can't say this enough. Dry fire practice with a real firearm is just as important, if not more, than actually going to the range and using it. So definitely I'm excited to see this technology. And hands down, I would try it in a heartbeat. I don't know if I would pull the trigger yet on this purchase. I might wait to see, you know, what improvements they make. But this is kind of cool. Although I have to imagine, like, so I don't know about like where you live, but I bought a house where lots of windows. Like I'm trying to think how many windows I have, like maybe like 40 windows or something. It's something crazy. And it costs a lot of money in blinds. And I bought this house brand new. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, oh, the window seemed like such a great idea until they're quoting you like 7,000 for blinds. But on top of that, I live where it's like a very new development and they're just stacking these houses on top of each other. So like, you know exactly what your neighbors are doing. (laughs) And I didn't pay for all these freaking windows just so I can close my blinds. So it's kind of like, okay, well, either you're going to see me naked and you can close your blinds because I'm not closing my blinds or we can both see each other naked. It is what it is. But, you know, whatever. But I could only imagine, which isn't true, I don't walk around naked, but I could only imagine Imagine that like what my neighbors would think me using this virtual reality thing with my gun and <laughs> as it is, it's, I don't know. I don't. Well, I, they can think that they want. Yeah. I think the same thing. I kind of live in a, in like a suburb, but I live on like a city block, right? Yeah. Like, like in town. Um, and I used to be very careful about, you know, only carrying so many guns back and forth to the vehicles if I was outside mm-hmm. and only, you know, only putting them in this one great case. And now I'll just, you know, I just throw this thing on and the holster. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no. You know what? If you had a problem, you'd care by now. Or if you have a problem, go ahead, wrap me out. Come say something called. Yeah. The cops. I'd, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not. 
I don't know. Maybe you it's know. all the fighting we do in the, you know, in, in the political and the court arenas that I'm just like, you know what? I'm not doing anything wrong and I don't care. If you've got a problem, it's your problem. So yeah, yeah go ahead. Go, uh, yeah. Would yeah be, right. It will be funny to see that. I always think it's funny seeing somebody with one of those VR headsets on. I don't know why. It would become know. more normal. But anytime I see someone move around with one of those things on, maybe it's that I can't see their eyes. Yeah. Um, it's, I'm always like, whoa, what's that guy doing? I know. We, we did get to talk to, or Jordan got to talk to and, uh, and see these guys from the ACE. Um, and we're actually trying to get our optics into their virtual environment that they have developed. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to try to talk him into buying one. Yeah, uh, because somebody has to, right? Like, I, I, it absolutely is a cool technology. I would like to see it, uh, like to see it go the direction you were talking about. Like, like to see where it can go with mm -hmm. more development. Yeah. Um, so somebody's got to somebody's got to buy that first gen and yeah. have all the problems, don't they? So yeah, exactly. I'm trying to talk him into being that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I think. I mean, I just think it would be a lot of fun. But same reason why I haven't bought one of those headsets either, because I'm just like, I don't want to be that nerd, that weirdo who's like in their own little headspace. Like, I feel like I'm in my headspace enough and not in reality. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Stupid, funny, cool, interesting, awesome as. F Never mind. A F. Engaged in the business rule challenged in the Federal Northern District of Texas, Gun Owners of America, Gun Owners Foundation, Virginia Citizens Defense League, Tennessee Firearms Association, Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Utah have filed suit against the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives over its new rule that would require thousands of Americans to get a federal firearms license to sell their guns. So I actually talked about this in the last episode of Pew Pew Panel, but you guys heard that right. Philip Van Cleef, president of VCDL, said, quote unquote, ATF, with prodding by the Biden administration, has declared war on gun ownership by making it legally dangerous to sell even a single personally owned firearm. We cannot turn a blind eye and let the government threaten our Second Amendment rights. The ATF's actions are clearly unconstitutional, overly broad and capricious, and we will get this settled in court. For decades, Democrats have pushed for universal background checks, but have failed at every turn to pass a law through Congress to do so because Americans do not agree with it. Rhinos, including John Curran, foolishly helped Biden pass the so-called bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which a bunch of us warned against, but they foolishly went along with it. The act included changing the definition of a gun dealer from someone who sells a gun with, quote, the principal objective of livelihood and profit to someone who, quote unquote, predominantly earns a profit. Neither one means everyone clearly, yet the small change along with the ATF's new rule, which is so ambiguous and confusing, they will consider anyone who sells a firearm without an FFL to be breaking the law. So literally, like, let's say you had a gun from 20 years ago and you were like, you know what? It's just been sitting around collecting dust. I'm going to sell it. Obviously, you're probably going to make a profit or even with inflation being as crazy as it is today, a gun that you bought like a year ago and you sell it, you know, it could have increased in value and you make, let's say, even a dollar, five dollars, whatever. Now it's considered, you know, that you made a profit and you need a federal firearms license. So the plaintiffs claim in the case that the rule violates the Second Amendment and runs contrary to the Gun Control Act because the statute is ambiguous about who is a gun dealer and the ATF is trying to clamp down on the rights of American gun owners to acquire and dispose of personal firearms. What they're really doing is creating a registration, even though they are expressly forbidden from doing that under federal law, because at every opportunity, ATF is digitalizing records which are searchable in violation of law. In addition to the Second Amendment claim, the plaintiffs are arguing that the government is violating the Fourth Amendment rights of gun owners because FFLs must allow the ATF to conduct warrantless and unannounced inspections, it would mean that anyone forced to get an FFL under the new rule must allow the ATF to search their home at any given time. Additionally, it violates the Fifth Amendment and its due process clause, since the ATF will assume anyone selling a firearm without an FFL is guilty and must prove their innocence. It also violates the separation of powers in the Administration Procedures Act. 
only Congress has the ability to make laws and what was passed in the BSCA was absolutely not universal background checks, which is essentially what this will amount to. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxson said, yet again, Joe Biden is weaponizing the federal bureaucracy to rip up the Constitution and destroy our citizens' Second Amendment rights. This is a dramatic escalation of his tyrannical abuse of authority. With today's lawsuit, it is my great honor to defend our constitutionally protected freedoms from the out-of-control federal government. Plaintiffs are asking for a restraining order, preliminary injunction, or administrative stay on the rule until the merits of the case can be heard. Florida also filed a similar case this week as well. Thursday, a third suit was filed in the Eighth Circuit by Arkansas and Kansas attorney generals, and they're joined by the AGs from Alabama, Alaska, Georgia, Idaho, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, New Hampshire, North Dakota, Oklahoma, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Virginia, West Virginia, and Wyoming. So in all, 26 states are now suing the Biden administration's new rule, which is great. And I hope they win because at this point, I mean, there is so much government overreach. It is blowing my mind. And I think this is why I've gotten so politically active, but I also cannot voice it enough that like people need to stop being complacent or they need to stop just accepting it. Like, well, this is, you know, this is our new life now. This is what happens. I guess we can't sell any guns, you know, or I mean, if you want to sell a gun, you'd have to go through uh, an FFL. But like what you guys fail to realize is like in Colorado, I have to go through an FFL. But in a lot of states, private sales are still very much legal. And you don't have to go through an FFL. And so uh, by pushing this, they're trying to essentially make, you know, all guns accounted for. And that sounds like kind of common sense. Like, well, yeah, that's kind of good, though. It'll fight crime. At the end of the day, it isn't not going to fight crime. I personally think that the less the government knows about you, the better, because the more guns that they know that you have, uh, the more likely they are to show up at your door and confiscate those guns. And if you think that we're not at that point, I would very much beg to differ. This should fail miserably on constitutionality. I can't believe we're even fighting it, but this looks like to me, at least this looks like it's another case of the government, right? Of a bureau of a bureaucracy making things fuzzy, Mm -hmm. which is not the way it's supposed to be in America, especially things that are potential crimes should be, you either have done the crime or you haven't done the crime. Um, and here they're just redefining or changing the words. Like we just want th- these words and these words mean kind of the same thing, but this one's clear and it absolutely isn't. Yeah. It makes it fuzzier. It makes it more difficult for an average American to know whether they're committing a crime or not. Uh, this may be the worst one yet. Yeah. And I also have to wonder, like, how are they tracking any of this? You know, let's say somebody pays for that gun with cash. Like there's no way that they're going to track it. If you had a gun that you, you know, that you had 20 years ago, or even if you got that gun legally, like, I think this is what irritates me too, is all of these stupid laws that they're pushing. There's just so much ways, so many ways around it. But again, that's sort of my, my mindset sometimes. Like I think about like how, you know, okay, you know, this is the law that they're trying to push. How are people able to get around it? And like, there's just, there's very few laws that people aren't able to get around. And once again, it's just criminalizing that law abiding citizen. And I say law abiding, but I'm I'm hesitant to even say law abiding anymore because, you know, they're pushing so many laws that it's like you're basically asking for these law abiding citizens, these people that are not the ones committing these crimes, but you're basically putting them in a position where it's like, all right, eventually, like, eventually we've got to say no and put our foot down and not comply. And, you know, I mean, I guess that's a that's a story for another day. But I mean, I'm kind of getting to that point. <laughs> like, Yeah, we need right. to workshop a new word. Law abiding isn't going to take it anymore because of every edict. The ATF for Joe Biden hands down as a law. I'm yeah. Not much longer going to be considered a, a law abiding. Yeah. We're going to have to have a new exactly. word. Exactly. That's I know that's not going to fly. I don't like to lie. And mm-hmm. uh, that's quickly, quickly going to turn me into a liar. I know how this administration is going. Yeah, I know. I get it. I mean, I even think about like if the assault weapons bill passes, I'm like, all right, like, what am I going to do? I mean, I guess I could go up to Wyoming where there's private sales and just buy from people there that I know and still have these guns. 
And there you go. I just bypassed that. Or so another thing is the firearm merchant category codes was just passed in Colorado. The governor signed it. So now whenever you buy a gun in Colorado, and I don't know when this is going to go into effect. I think it's don't quote me. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. So it hasn't gone into effect yet, but it's like, okay, well, people could just pay cash now, but then you have to think, well, this is a sort of criminalizing, or I guess, you know, categorizing these people that can't afford to pay cash because firearm purchases are pretty big purchases and not everybody could just afford to pay cash. So then it's essentially hurting these people that are, I guess, lower income where typically that's Democrats constituents. So it's like you guys aren't even representing your constituents because this is hurting the lower income. And I don't know, it's, it's just, it's ridiculous, but there's lots of ways that you can kind of skirt around this stuff where you don't have to, as much as I want to say like, yes, guys, the laws follow the laws and like be a good person. It's getting to the point where I'm like, you know what? You do what you got to do because the last thing I want is for anybody to strip me of my second amendment rights and I'm not able to defend myself or my loved ones. Amen. All right. We do have one review. It is from JB 96 titled empowering five stars. I've been around guns all my life, but have just recently got involved with them as a hobby. I love all the information Ava provides about the firearms industry products and what is going on in politics slash the news. Keep up the great work. Thank you very much. You guys could find me at gunfunny.com. There's links to everything. I would say, you know, we only have when this show comes out uh, on Wednesday is the last day of the legislative session. We'll see where we are, but just keep in mind that, you know, if things have gotten out of control, I would greatly appreciate you guys contacting my senators uh, in Colorado. And you could do so by just going to gunfunny.com, click on top of the homepage, and there's a link and literally one click will email all of the centers uh, through, you know, blind carbon copy or whatever that BCC means. And I would greatly appreciate your help because, again, if we're not fighting it, if we don't stop it, it is going to spread to other states. Also, if you enjoy the show and you want to support it, consider becoming a Patreon. You could do so by just going to gunfunny.com, click on the support the show link. And then also, I want to thank the $25 Patreons who are Sake Holsters, Daniel Treadwell, Keith Callamore, Daniel Lee, Nick Theodosian, Tristan Smith, Melissa Ridings, William Nave, and Patrick Comer. And then as always, thank you, Jon Snow, for being king of the Patreon. And Bob, thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoy just your insight, all the hard work that you guys are doing over there at Gideon Optics. And, you know, it's a pleasure to work with you guys. And yeah, so I really appreciate it. Can you just remind people once again, where they could find you, what your website is, social media, YouTube channel, all that good stuff. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me and for being an inspiration. Um, like that review just said to so many others out there who might be thinking about getting involved. You can find us at GideonOptics.com. And don't forget, you can use coupon code GUNFUNNY to get 10% off and free shipping on all the products we have there. You can also find us on X, YouTube, and Instagram. Gideon Optics, all one word, is what you'd want to search for. Um, now thank you so much for having me. Thank everyone for listening. Uh, we appreciate all your support. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. And I will talk to you next week. Want to send feedback? Tell us about a company or anything else. Go to gunfunny.com forward slash contact. <laughs>